Oh boy. I don't think you guys are ready for this one. I mean, you'd think Capcom would have learned their lesson after the first two DOS Mega Man games and like, put together their own dev team for porting Mega Man X or contacting some other team that had some experience with doing this kind of thing. But no, this game right here, this CD, which I'm actually holding in my hands, and I'll even open it to prove to you that this thing is real. This was put together by the same people who made the DOS Mega Man games. The first two, I mean. It's like... Actually, you know, I think I have an idea of what's going on here. I don't think it was Capcom that contacted Roster's little group. I think they contacted Capcom. I mean, it would explain a whole bunch of things, like why these games came out so much later than their original releases. Like, this game right here came out two years after the original SNES game. And, you know, there's actually something else, too, is that the first two DOS Mega Man games, they had nothing to do with their NES counterparts. Well, almost nothing. Whereas this... This actually comes extremely close to being spot on to the SNES original. And yet somehow manages to still miss the mark by a huge degree. Like, I mean, let's just compare the two versions, like, when you start them up. <laughs> Let's just play this thing. Tandy 3 voice, how the frick is that even possible? Yeah, anyways, as previously stated, the DOS version of Mega Man X was developed by Rosner Labs and published directly through Capcom in 1995, skipping high tech expressions this time around. And it came out roughly two years after the original release of Mega Man X on the SNES. It's a one-player run-and-gun platform, with support for VGA 320x200 256 color graphics and an insane number of audio devices, though it's made possible through the use of third-party audio libraries, which is actually a fairly common thing for companies to do in the later days of making DOS games. In this case, the audio drivers came from Miles Design. As for its current release date, it's still commercial, and while the DOS version of Mega Man X isn't too hard to find, it's not too common either. But due to low demand, because of how much this port sucks, don't expect to pay more than about $10 to $15 for a loose copy, a little more for a jewel case copy with the manual like I have here, or a massive amount if it's fully boxed, as it was actually originally bundled with a special six button controller. Which I'm kind of curious in terms of how that would even work, since it's normally not possible to detect more than four buttons on a game port joystick. In any case, this makes a fully boxed copy highly collectible, even if only because of that reason alone. When Mega Man X came out, it kind of confused people because everyone thought the X meant 10, but the latest Mega Man game released at the time on the NES was 5. So the thought was that maybe the SNES version was starting with 10 because it was a new 16-bit system with new graphics and everything. But no, the reason it was called X was because it featured a new incarnation of Mega Man named simply X. And it actually became something of a tradition following that with each new generation of gaming. Capcom would create a new imagining of Mega Man. With the 32-bit and 64-bit consoles, we got Mega Man Legends. With the Game Boy Advance, we got Mega Man Battle Network. And others would follow suit on future consoles. Though I haven't actually played any of the other ones. The story in Mega Man X isn't quite the same as the original Mega Man games. In fact, it can't be, because even though Mega Man X takes place in the same universe as the original Mega Man series, it does so roughly 100 years following the events of those main series games, meaning Dr. Light and Dr. Wily have long since passed on. The story actually technically starts back in the late days of Dr. Light, who finishes a prototype robot simply dubbed X, capable of independent thought and free will something his prior creations, even Mega Man, weren't completely capable of. However, it would take countless years of internal testing to ensure this robot systems would comply with the first law of robotics. A robot may not injure a human being. Though, it's being paraphrased in this game to instead read, a robot must never harm a human being. 
Now fast forward 100 years, and a scientist by the name of Dr. Kane unearths the pod X was stored in, and is completely impressed with X's capabilities. After months of investigating X's programming and design, Dr. Kane discovers the means by which X functions, and is finally able to replicate Dr. Light's work, creating many more robots with independent thought and free will and... Yeah, you guys see where this is going. A few of these reploids, as they're called, go rogue and begin to engage in criminal activity, which is referred to by everyone as going maverick. To help deal with the situation, a special task force of reploids is built known as the Maverick Hunters, led by a very powerful reploid known as Sigma. Now, everything's fine for a few months, but then, amazingly, not only does Sigma go Maverick, but he somehow manages to convince most of the other hunters to join him in his quest to eradicate humanity. What few hunters remain are now led by a reploid known as Zero, and during this whole ordeal, X is questioning how responsible he is for what's going on. And ultimately, X makes the decision to join the Maverick Hunters and fight to protect humanity from Sigma and his army of Mavericks. Also, something I feel I should point out, the story in the Mega Man games has always been kind of contrived and convoluted to some extent. But the Mega Man X series is notorious for just going nuts with this, getting more and more ridiculous with each game released. X7 in particular is considered to be one of the worst Mega Man games ever made for a fairly lengthy list of reasons. And quite frankly, I'm not sure if I'd rather be playing that or this butchered port. Okay, where to begin? Well, let's get some basic gameplay mechanics out of the way first. Mega Man X plays very much like a traditional Mega Man game where you run around, shoot things, charge your weapon shots, and can acquire the weapons of the bosses that you defeat. However, X has a few additional tricks up his armor-plated sleeves. Firstly, right from the start of the game, X has a wall kick move, which you can use to not only scale vertical walls, but you can also use it to escape from pits before you completely fall down them, make tricky jumps, or even slowly descend lengthy vertical sections. Wall kicking is also extremely useful for evading attacks in some boss fights. Now, as you progress through the game, X gains upgrades to his form, ultimately getting special leg, chest, head, and buster upgrades. The leg upgrade must be obtained to get any of the others, and enables X to do quick dashes at extremely high speed, and can even be used to vault off of walls by dashing and kicking at the same time. The chest upgrade reduces damage by half, the head upgrade allows breaking through certain kinds of blocks with your head, and is only used like twice in the entire game, and only once for anything useful, while the buster upgrade allows charging shots to a third level of power and also lets you charge boss weapons into a special state where they can have a completely different and often extremely powerful effect. One major difference between Mega Man X and the original Mega Man series is that the boss names don't all end in man. The bosses this time around, and in my preferred order for defeating them, are Chill Penguin, Spark Mandrill, Armored Armadillo, Launch Octopus, Boomer Kuanger, Sting Chameleon, Storm Eagle, and then finally, Flame Mammoth. Actually, one really neat feature in this game is that when you hit a boss with the weapon they're weak to, a special effect often occurs, or you'll at the very least see more flashing than you normally would. For instance, the ice weapon from Chill Penguin can actually temporarily freeze Spark Mandrill, making the battle incredibly easy if you get the timing down. And then, if you go and use his electric weapon against the armored armadillo, it will destroy its armor, allowing you to hit it while it's curled up in a ball. And that's pretty much all you need to know about Mega Man X in general. Now let's dive into how screwed up this port is. Before we talk about the issues this port has over the original game, there's something I need to quickly address. In the past, I've mentioned on more than one occasion outside of this show that I believe that this DOS port to be made out of prototype assets. Now I had a lot of reasons to believe this was the case, however, now that I have hands-on experience with this thing, it's safe to say that, no, Rosner Labs was given proper assets to the game. They just didn't use many of them. And to prove this, here's a 4.3 aspect screen capture of the Robot Select screen at 256 by 224 resolution from the SNES game. And here's the same select screen at the same aspect ratio at 320 by 200 resolution from the DOS version. Now they look similar, but there's clearly subtle differences. But, since I was finally able to get 1 to 1 pixel aspect captures of both games, I was able to confirm something very interesting. 
Here are these same screens at a 1 to 1 pixel aspect ratio. If the graphics were exact copies, these would have an identical aspect ratio, and yet they don't. The only possible explanation that makes sense is that Rosner Labs actually redrew a lot of the artwork for this game. Now, I checked this with many art assets in this game, and all of them were clearly redrawn. Not the sprites, though. I did the same test with the sprites, and as you can see, they're completely identical. Now, let's move on to the one thing which has been assailing your ears since we started this review, and that's the music. Now, the sound effects in this game are spot-on perfect, clearly pulled from the SNES assets. Though, they lack the reverb effect that the SNES version does automatically, which you can hear better either with headphones or setting the SNES version to mono sound. But why is this important in terms of the music? Because unlike other game systems prior to the SNES, the SNES does not have FM synth capabilities. All music has to be produced using digitized samples, similar to the mod files pioneered on Amiga computers. This means Rosner Labs should have received both the musical tracks and the instrument samples to go with them to replicate the music perfectly. But as you can hear, that's clearly not what happened. Instead, the music has been lazily converted to MIDI format and is being run through a generic MIDI conversion library to try and reproduce the music using miscellaneous MIDI devices. And here's a few quick samples of some of my favorite tunes from the SNES version compared to the DOS version. Again, this port came out in 1995. The amount of power an average computer had at this time should have been more than enough to play back a multi-channel mod file and have some platforming gameplay running alongside without issue. But as you're about to see, they didn't even get that right. Let's actually go back to the SNES version for a moment. Notice that it runs fluidly at 60 frames per second. It does suffer some slowdown from time to time, but remains surprisingly playable despite that. When we look back at the DOS version, we see there's something weird going on with the frame rate. Remember that the VGA specs for 320x200 resolution called for 70 frames per second, not 60. Ironically, if Rosner Labs hacked in 320x240 graphics instead of using the default 320x200, they would have got their 60fps spec. But nope, that's not what they did. Instead, the game's been redesigned to run at half of the VGA refresh rate which is 35 frames per second, which already feels strange, but it also includes a speed setting, so you can adjust how many frames per second the game aims to maintain, which in turn affects the speed of the game. The game actually feels significantly faster than the SNES version as a result of this, even though it's actually only very slightly faster. There's also been a lot of unusual tweaks to how the game plays. For starters, Mega Man's Buster shots move substantially faster than the SNES game. Normally, you wouldn't think this would be a big deal, but it actually makes the DOS version of the game incredibly more difficult than the SNES version due to an interesting quote-unquote bug that's present in both. You cannot hit an enemy while they're flashy. In the SNES version, enemies only flash for a single frame, so it's nearly impossible to hit them a second time while flashing from the first hit. But if you manage to do it, they only take damage from the first shot which hit them. Now, since the bullets move slower in the SNES version, this means when you charge up and fire a super-powered buster shot, the super-powered shot will always hit first and do lots of damage like it's supposed to. In the DOS version, however, when you charge up a super-powered shot, fire, and immediately press the button to charge up another, you also fire a weaker shot, which moves fast enough to outrun the powered-up shot. 
then you end up hitting an enemy with the weaker shot, then because they flash for a single frame, which actually lasts for the equivalent of two SNES frames due to the decreased frame rate, they get hit by the powered up shot while still in the flashing state, meaning despite hitting them for what should have been tons of damage, you only hit them for a single point, since the powered up shot gets cancelled out by the weaker shot. If you're coming from the SNES version, this is going to completely mess you up, and you're going to have a, to rethink all of your strategies or you're going to want to make it through this thing. Now, if that wasn't bad enough in terms of affecting the difficulty, there's actually been some additional tweaks to the difficulty, and some of the basic enemies which can be defeated with a single fully charged buster shot now take an extra shot beyond that to defeat. Enemies you could breeze by in the SNES game are now surprisingly challenging obstacles as a result of this. I did test though and find out that only the hit points of weaker enemies had been changed. Mini bosses, bosses, and larger enemies all have the same number of hit points as in the SNES version. Though the hit boxes are also somewhat different, making the red cars near the end of the opening level surprisingly hard to deal with. Plus, you actually have to destroy three of them minimum at the end of the opening level, whereas in the SNES version, you could get away with only destroying two if you did it right. I will say though that despite the odd changes and omissions with this port, such as the lack of ride armor or the missing enemy roll call during the ending sequence, what is here has been copied extremely carefully, almost as though Capcom was well aware of how terrible the first two DOS Mega Man games were, and had Rosner Labs by the throat to make this game as accurate as possible to the SNES game. I mean, characterized blink and sync during the cutscenes, they're even out of sync when they're out of sync in the SNES game. Enemies and bosses have all of their proper animations and attacks, although some of them haven't been done nearly as well or timed differently. There's even a save system to take the place of the password system from the original game. Though I question the decision to use the flashing red background from the intro as the background for the save screen. I did notice something very curious while going through this DOS port though, and I have to give a spoiler warning on this one so skip ahead about 45 seconds if you don't want to hear it. But during the Flame Mammoth stage, the hidden area with the Buster upgrade has been much easier to reach. In the SNES original, it's supposed to be a pro-level secret, only meant to be accessed by expert players due to how insanely accurate your jumps need to be to get in. Normally, you would get the Buster upgrade from Zero after he sacrifices himself during the second fight with Vile. However, I tried playing through the DOS version while skipping the Buster upgrade, and no, Zero doesn't give it to you. Meaning, what used to be a pro-level secret had to be downgraded into a regular secret so that players could actually obtain this upgrade without having to have the game mastered. This is otherwise the only real level design change I came across. Lastly, I just want to mention that there's a somewhat major issue with the animation timing in this game, as many of the animations either run too fast or are out of sync in some weird way. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to make a huge deal for most of the game, and mostly just makes the cutscenes play kind of awkwardly or have enemies laughing at the wrong moments when they hit you. These timing problems, though, also cause the text to scroll incredibly fast during the opening and ending sequences. Which kind of makes me wonder if they were simply doing that to hide their atrocious misspelling of Nintendo. They tried. They really tried. Rosner Labs are almost certainly in a position where they had to do it right or never make a Mega Man game again, because the amount of effort put into making this version of the game as accurate in appearance and gameplay as possible to the SNES was extreme. But they clearly either ran out of time or ran Capcom's patience to its limits, because what we ended up with was a port that feels extremely accurate in some ways and completely terrible in others. I highly recommend avoiding this port of the game and to either go for one of the many digital ports or collection discs out there, or an actual SNES cart, as I still own mine from when I was a kid. Basically, the only reason you'd want the DOS version is for sake of collecting, as all the other ports definitely play better and sound better than this one. If you actually want to play this version for whatever reason, setting this game up in DOSBox can be a little tricky. First of all, you need to set a high fixed cycles count. Now you can slow down some of the animations by using a lower fixed cycles count, but this in turn also makes the rest of the gameplay stutter pretty badly. You always want to set the core to dynamic mode so that you can actually use a higher cycles count without any issues. 
And next you want to turn off timed intervals for the joystick support, if you intend to use a gamepad. And you're pretty much stuck using a digital D-pad since even the tiniest amount of analog movement will screw with the menus. So you'll want to cancel out the analog sticks using the DOSBox key mapper. Now since most D-pads are mapped as hats on computers, this means you'll also have to set the joystick into a mode which normally would have a hat, like FCS mode. You'll also want to turn off button wrap so you can set up more than four buttons. Next, you need to enable gust support. This game does technically work with Sound Blaster sound effects, but because of how screwy the animation timing is, and because some animations also trigger sound cues, the sound channels can end up getting completely messed up with the Sound Blaster support. So it's better to use the gust support for digitized sound. You'll still need to set Sound Blaster or General MIDI or something else for the music. A General MIDI might sound better than FM Synth for some people for the music, so you can always give that a try if you want. Lastly, if you do go with gust sounds and sound blaster for the music, you'll immediately notice the music is freaking loud and the sounds are super quiet. So you'll want to adjust the DOSBox mixer levels with the following mixer values using the internal mixer command. It's a lot of steps, but if you want this game to play and sound its best, relatively speaking, you gotta do all this. Anywho. That's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next Saturday is episode 208, where we'll be taking a look at a game where the main form of currency isn't gold pieces, or gill, or dollars, or anything sane. Instead, it's crowns. And if you think you know of a game which is like that, then be sure to send your guests to ADG at Pixelships.com, and stay tuned to see yet another game which may come as a surprise to some people. Thanks for watching everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small sample, you guys. Okay, time to answer the burning question on everyone's mind. What does the music sound like in Tandy 3 voice mode? Thank you.